Have you ever said when you're gambling, mm, I don't know, I didn't add it up yet? I call that gambling denial, kind of like an ostrich having its head in the sand. Maybe it's Monday morning and you're by the water cooler or in the coffee shop and another buddy who gambles on sports along with you says, well, how'd you do last weekend? Ah, I broke about even, maybe down a little bit. You know, I call that gambling denial. It's, it's everyone loves to win, nobody likes to lose. I remember the very first time I went to Las Vegas. I was really young, exactly 21. And coming back on the plane, I was talking to a guy and he, I said, so if you don't mind me asking, how did you do? He said, ah, I did okay. I went there with 500 bucks and I expected to lose it. And you know, I'm, I'm good with that. Well, my first journey to Las Vegas, the population was slightly less than 200,000 people. And now if you go there, it's, it's a million plus, well over a million plus. So how did they go from 200,000 to well over a million plus when the majority of people you talk to is, ah, I did okay, I broke about even. Exactly, I call all of that gambling denial. Now, I had to learn how to lose before I began to learn how to win. And I've been at this game for over 40 years. And back in the day when I first started, there were no laptops, there was no computers. As a matter of fact, we didn't even have odds po posted in the newspaper. And, you know, you would talk with the local bookies. And back in those days, the 49ers were killing it. Washington was doing really, really well. So if the true line was six and a half or seven, you can be damn sure you were paying a premium if you wanted to bet on the 49ers at minus, say, seven and a half or eight versus what the real number would have been. And, and so on and so forth with the Steelers back in their heyday when they were uh, popular. The same situation holds true today. Look at the Kansas City Chiefs. They've been abysmal covering the spread. Now, they did go on a 15-2 and two ATS run when Mahomes first started, but everybody caught up to that quickly. And once again, we find the Chiefs now sitting, I believe they're 1-12 and won their last 14 ATS. So these public teams... They love to be backed, and as, as long as you're not making an adjustment, the books don't have to make an adjustment either. So referring to gambling denial, again, I repeat, it's, it's not keeping proper records. You know, you should keep a ledger. Keep a ledger of what the opening line was, what the closing, closing line was, what was the number, obviously, when you bet. That's the most important number. And of, course, and, of course, I think you should split your over and under wages. Keep them in a separate Excel file versus your ATS numbers. It's the only way that you can actually learn how to win. You know, it seems so easy. There's two teams, and you get first choice. First pick is up to you. Yet, 90-some percent of people that wager on sports, whether it's football, basketball, hockey, or baseball, or maybe tennis or golf, they lose. And the reason why they lose is they don't prepare properly. They just, they don't have adequate time. They don't keep proper records. They don't do enough research. Research is the key. There's all kinds of information up on the website for you to go to and, and look at if you're not inclined to, to go with a, a sports service. And uh, I'm not here to promote my sports service. That's entirely up to you. What I do is I look at the odds for the upcoming week before those odds are posted. I make rough numbers. Uh, a good example was in week two. I had the, uh, the over-under on the uh, Chargers game at 54 points against the Cowboys in week two. That's what I thought the number should be. It opened at 50 and a half. As it, as it ended up going uh, up, up to 55 or 55 and a half, it didn't matter either because the, uh, the line, the game stayed well under the, uh, well, well under the total. Uh, I believe it was a 17-14 final. So, you know, make, make the odds up from the sides or totals which you figure they should be before you go ahead and, and look at the look-ahead lines. Now, obviously, injuries are going to come into play there. Let's take a look at offshore sports betting versus the local states now in America and the provincial uh, provinces in Canada. And in, in cases like this, you have to bet only what you have in the account. So, you, you know, you're not stepping out over your head like you could do on a line of credit with a local uh, bookmaker. So getting back to this, and, and we'll go into this in detail on a Monday night podcast. Uh, as I've often said for many years, Monday night football is more times than not a bookmaker's best friend. And that'll, we'll get to that in a different podcast. So how do we correct a problem with gambling? Well... The one thing is, as I've always said, is bet what you can afford to lose, not what you hope to win. And remember, if you're in Nevada there and you're going through those casinos or in the other states in the U.S. that have legalized gambling, 
When you walk through the front door, always remember, the sign says casino. It doesn't say bank. And many people fall into that problem. Marquee sports wagering is, is another issue. I very seldom lay out big money on a, a Sunday night or a Monday night game. Uh, it's a standalone game. You've had all week to figure out what you're going to do with the Saturday college games and uh, the numerous games on uh, Sunday. And if you let's say you, you make six plays and you go two and four. Well, you had all those other opportunities to choose from on Sunday and you still couldn't get it right. So now up comes Monday night and um, it's on TV. So you've got to have a little wager on it. A little wager might be the key word there or perhaps no wager at all because Again, these numbers are really tight on these marquee games. It's the same thing when you look at college basketball when Duke is up against North Carolina. You won't see as sharp a line on Drake playing another Mac, a Mac, a Mac 10 school or a Mac school. One of my classic lines is, hmm, I've got a hunch. Well, if you've got a hunch, don't bet a bunch. When comparing like your local state wagering or provincial wagering up in Canada, versus offshore wagering. The key there is you have to have disposable income. You have to have that money there. You're not betting on credit, where sometimes if you're betting on credit and it's the Monday night game, the last game on the board, you know, you've got a hunch and you go bet a bunch to try to get under that number. And that can uh, really create problems for you. Uh, you may get cut off from the bookmaker or maybe worse, Guido comes around with a baseball bat and he's talking football collections, not Major League Baseball collections, if you know what I mean. So you have to, money management is a key, a very key important factor in learning how to win rather than lose. Now, when you speak about learning, I had to learn how to lose for a long time before I learned how to win in sports. And I was, believe me, I was damn good at losing. I didn't have the benefit of satellites or computers and all I could do is keep my records. And it started when I developed a set of systems. And this was uh, really tried and true. I, I had to research this diligently because, as mentioned, there were no uh, uh, computer programs for me at that time on the so-and-so team did this. What do, happens when all teams do this and do that? So I do utilize systems, and believe me, they are entirely different than trends and angles. So you can keep that in mind. You know, uh, if, you, if you keep wagering on a certain team and, it, and it's not doing well in a certain spot, it's not just that team that is doing you in. It could be a factor of all the other teams combined. So as I mentioned, I began, keep, uh, began keeping a set of records, sides, and totals, made my own power ratings. And when the games concluded on Sunday, I would make up my own power ratings for those lines. And the local paper never published odds. I remember when I was in Nevada and uh, I saw there was a 702 number, you know, Nevada's area code, where I could... Uh, go in and call that number long distance and find out what the true lines were on for all the sports, especially football. And then I would compare that to the bookmaker. And I remember uh, saying to one of the good maker, uh, bookmakers, and God bless his soul, he's gone to bookmaker heaven. And uh, I wanted to make a bet on the 49ers. And he said, the line's eight and a half. And I said, well, in Vegas, it's six and a half. And he said, well, go to Vegas and bet it then. Bet it, go, go bet it in Vegas. My line's eight and a half. And then he smiled in a little wink and he said, or you could take eight and a half in the underdog. So obviously he was there to protect himself. So that's another key issue. You have to have numerous outs. If you're playing with just one local guy or, or one book, uh, and it may not seem like a lot, but sometimes the, you know there's a huge difference between minus three or minus three and a half. I'll take a look at week, th week three that just played out where we had the Raiders go from uh, a four and a half point favorite down to four down to three and a half. So I saw one out that was minus three. So what happened in that score? Vegas wins by three points. So if you bet, if you relate to the party and bet the dog, you pushed rather than winning. The key number when gambling on sports in football is minus three and minus seven. Those are the most two numbers that are landed on more than any other. Even with that two point conversion rule that came back a few years ago, it's still minus three, it's still minus two. Now, again, uh, going back to last week at Mississippi State, we're plus two and a half at home against LSU. I went and bought the hook and got the dog at three. I got a push rather than losing. If I like a game and the line's three and a half and the juice isn't $1.35, I'll, I'll go down to minus three. And vice versa, like if the line is plus six and a half, I'll buy that up to plus seven. Uh, and the same thing if it's seven and a half and I like the favorite, I'll, I'll look for a seven. Uh, and again, if you can get, you know, the, the, the juice factor going from six and a half up to seven is not as prohibitive as going from 
minus three and a half down to minus three. So keep records, get your own systems. Uh, don't rely on what your friends say. You know, everybody has an opinion and we all sit on those opinions. If We all sit on them, if you know what I mean. Remember this, you can learn how to win by learning from your losing wagers. If you don't learn from your losses, you're not going to be gambling for long. Unless, of course, you're Bill Gates or the CEO of um, Amazon or, or Musk. Yeah, I think you get the drift there. So you have to ask yourself, why did, what, where did I go wrong with these games? You know, like, especially if you've had a bad weekend. Don't just say, oh, let's soldier on to next week and go and fund your account for another grand or 1500 why, do, why are these sports books in business? They're in business because, uh, as I've mentioned before, over 90% of the people that wager on sports are losers. And you don't want to be a loser, and hopefully that's why you're watching this video, and I'm going to help you learn how to win. Now, another key factor is what I call the checklist. Okay, the checklist is, is very important. You should prepare a checklist of why you like or dislike certain games. Is your logic sound? You have to ignore the advice of your friends. Even if your friend's on a hot streak, hot streaks are going to happen. They're going to come and they're going to go. And I know personally, I've gone on hot streaks and I've gone on all losing streaks. And it's a well-tried but true saying, gambling is a marathon, it's not a sprint. As long as you have money management, bankroll management is key, you can stay in the game. Are you better with sides? Are you better with totals? Keep track of that, as I mentioned before. So and don't fall into this scenario. If you like three games in, in a certain week, bet three games. If you like seven, bet seven. If you like nine, maybe you reduce your wager size because you've got a lot of money invested, but bet the nine games. You'll find more often than not that you'll hate yourself on, on uh, Monday morning when you look, you, you kicked out four games and three of them were winners. Certainly you can kick out those four games and sometimes they may go one and three as well. Another important thing is does that game that you want to wager on meet all your criteria? If you can't answer yes to all the methods I just mentioned, then pass on that game and move on to the next. Two teams, one line, and you get first pick. So it's amazing. You will see a lot of handicappers on YouTube, and they're on Twitter, they're on Instagram, they're hitting 80 90%. Are these guys monitored? The answer is obviously no, because long term, nobody can hit. 75, 80, 90%. I mean, you can hit 90% when you're betting on 10 games, but if you're betting on hundreds and hundreds of games or thousands in a year like I do, if I can hit 55%, I'm making everybody a lot of money, and you know, my clients, and I will help you make money here as well with these YouTube podcasts. We just got started. We've only had five selections so far that I've wagered on. We've won three and lost two. Hopefully we can keep that up to 55 to 60 percent over the course of the long time. One of the most important things is you have to be realistic about your expectations. 55 percent is a realistic number when wagering on sports. If you can go between 55 and 60 and you're um, able to have disposable income to be betting at least hundred dollars a unit, you're going to do okay long term. But it's tough to hit 55%. Uh, now, one thing exception is 55% in baseball isn't very good if you're betting on big favorites. I never bet big favorites. Another thing that I am leery on is laying a run and a half on the home team to get that juice down from uh, minus 200, maybe to minus a run and a half, minus a dollar 10. The problem with that sometimes is if the home team is up one run after the uh, road team has batted at the top of the ninth and gone out, the home team doesn't have to bat in the bottom of the ninth. And uh, that one one run win by the home team is a loser for you if you're laying a run and a half. I do have offshore outs where I'm able to lay minus one run, and I will often do that in that situation. Look for small dogs and small favorites. Uh, in baseball this year, I'm hitting uh, around 55%, and I think we're up close to $7,000 with uh, over 300 plays. So, and that's doing the part in part to uh, keeping those favorites really low and uh, finding some value on dogs as well. It's a, it's a little different in football, but here's another key thing. 
If you're betting offshore, like at Pinnacle or at Five Dimes or some of these sports books, sometimes you can lay minus three at minus a dollar five, rather than minus three at minus a dollar ten or minus three at minus a dollar fifteen. On all those losses, that juice definitely adds up and it it cuts into your bottom line. So shop for line value. Same thing even if you're going to a walk up in in New Jersey or Nevada or wherever these other sports books are are, are available, uh, like in Arizona and uh, throughout the U.S. See if you can find a plus three at minus uh, say a dollar a dollar five, a dollar eight, a dollar ten, or if you're getting three and a half, if they let you buy a hook. Some books may charge you a dollar thirty-five. Some may only charge you a dollar and a quarter. So every uh, those pennies add up to dollars. So money management is also a part of a line shopping. These all factor. These all factor into how you can cut your losses and reduce your profit margin. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe. Our next video will be Monday Night Football: A Bookmaker's Best Friend.